funny, she's smart, she craves chocolate every day, and she is the Greek goddess of coffee. Here is your host, Ellen Karras. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Karras' Comedy Corner. My name is Ellen Karras, and you are tuning into the guest edition of Karras' Comedy Corner. I cannot contain myself with today's guest. I am his biggest fan. Uh, before we get to him, though, let's do those ads. Our first sponsor is Baywalk Marketing. Go to their website, baywalk.net, for all of your advertising and marketing needs. They can help you with any kind of a flyer. They can help you analyze the demographics of your business. They can also uh, help you find out what is going on in the Greek community. Go to their website, hollywoodgreeks.com, to find out where all the Greek entertainment is and, and hellenicfestivals.org. Find out where there is a Greek festival near you. And I am telling you right now, the Suvlaki will be flying, I promise. Uh, and our other sponsor is Select Flex. What is it? It's an orthotic. What's an orthotic? You put it in your shoe. Why do you need that? Because your entire body needs it. Your support starts from your feet and works its way up. Your shins, your knees, your back, your hips, your entire alignment. I'm telling you right now, these have changed my life. I do not exercise without these. I just finished exercising, as you could tell by my outfits. Uh, and what is great about these orthotics that are different from anything over the counter is that they have an adjustability in the arch. You can change the arch from firm extra firm to extra extra firm depending on what your needs are go to their website selectflex.com s-e-l-e-c-t-f-l-e-x.com and for Kara's comedy corner listeners there is a 25 percent discount if you type in the code family 25 f-a-m-i-l-y 25 because you my audience i feel are my family and actually i get along much better than you than, with you than i do with my actual family so family 25 selectflex.com they have a great 30 second video, check them out, S E L E C T F L E X dot com. Okay, did I did I blow through that quick enough so I can get to our guest? Yes. I am so excited. I adore this man. I have gotten to know him. He is an actor. He is a Tony Award winner, an OB, an OB Award winner, a Tony Award nominee, a daytime Emmy Award winner. I'm not quite sure I got all that right. I'm just so verklempt. He has been in movies, film, Broadway, one person shows. You might know him, especially from the huge movie, The French Connection. But what I love is that uh, every so often I turn on a movie and there he appears. And he just told me before we went on air that he is now working on a movie with Ray Romano and Sebastian Maniscalco. I cannot wait to find out what's going on. On with that. He is a New Yorker. He is Brooklyn born. He is a huge, huge supporter of the military, of the police. This is a true, true patriot. I love this man. Without further ado, please welcome, and I'm honored to say, my friend, Tony Lobianco. <laughs> Am I excited enough? I oh mean, my, my, thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> oh my gosh. And a teacher, an acting teacher too, that you that you also do many years. You were you you to me are the quintessential New York actor. You have done every genre, theater, film, TV, the soaps, you've done your own show, you are a writer, you've taught. I mean, your body of work and what you have done, you are such. Uh, you're an actor's actor, especially. And what I find fascinating, especially when I talk to people that are either, yeah, I'm Greek, you're Italian, very, very similar, you know, ethnic like us, really Greeks and Italians. I always ask, like, it is such a non conventional profession that we chose. I mean, that's not quite how our families raised us. You either go in the family business or you become a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, it's something of that nature. It's never like, um, it's never really uh, the arts. But interesting enough to me, the most dramatic people are Greeks and Italians. So, <laughs> So, so it, to me, it's a natural fit, even though that's not quite what our parents tell us that they want us to be. So what was that like for you? What part of Brooklyn did you grow up in, by the way? Well, I was born on 39th Street and uh, around 3rd, 4th Avenue. Uh -huh. And then we moved, before I was 10 years old, we moved uh, to 56th Street, 5th Avenue, 49th Street and uh, 7th Avenue, and then when I was 10, 18th Avenue and 49th Street. So what part of Brooklyn was all that? Was that Bay Ridge or Benson? Bay Ridge, Bensonhurst, uh -huh, uh -huh. around that area. Kept kept moving, moving to that to those different places. 
And uh, so at the age of 10, I arrived in, in the eight, on 18th Avenue, 49th Street, and, and I grew up uh, all, all over the place. And, and uh, <clears throat> it, was a, it was a very dramatic uh, childhood, I would imagine. Uh, to, to, you know, you know it's, it's funny, <clears throat> diversity or uh, <clears throat> the difference of, uh, I guess that's a strange word today, uh, diversity, but uh, uh, my, my growing up had to do with a great deal of uh, conflict. Uh, the Irish and the Italian, they never got along that way. Uh, and back then, uh, and I say back then, I mean way back then. <laughs> uh, and we fought a lot and a lot of, uh, and I mean physically, uh, I did. Anyway, I was a, a street kid, basically. I came from a very loving family. I had two brothers, one five years younger than I and one 17, 18 years older than I. Mm. Uh, um, uh, months, uh, excuse me. Right. Uh, months, <laughs> years, uh -huh. months. And uh, we were very tight. I mean, it was almost legend how, how much we uh, uh, loved each other and uh, moved together kind of a thing. And then other, other families would sort of be amazed because headquarters was our house. You know, uh, every Sunday, of course, every Italian family, Sundays were at our house, dinners, uncles. I was fortunate enough to have eight uncles. That is a very, very important uh, family. As you can see, it's no, it's no mystery uh, to what's wrong with our country uh, and lack of family, lack of fathers, lack of, lack of mother and fathers together. And so obviously uh, the history, and I'm a big opponent of history, is there for everyone to see. That's what you're supposed to live by and learn from history. Otherwise you're inventing the wheel again. Right. And, uh, and, and many times when you, when you um, invent a wheel without <clears throat> knowledge of history, it's generally with a flat <laughs> and you, 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 do, you do the wrong things. So history and family are, are together. Now the idea of, of drama, uh, well, we all grew up with family stories. I mean, I'm talking about my mother and father who were taken out of school when they were eight years old to go to work, you know, to support the family. Right. Well, you know, it's almost like to, today comparison to, to baseball players who can only go seven innings. And, you know, they take them out after 95 or 100 pitches, like they're delicate pieces of, of glass. Mm -hmm. and, and back then when you were taken out of school for being eight years old to go to work. And the people who played ball back then without all the equipment and the health stuff that's going on now with all the, you know, preparing them, they were made of steel. Those people had guts. Those people pitched uh, double headers. Those pe people went 140, 50 pitches uh, and they were rugged and they had less, it's like, history of Leonardo da Vinci and, uh, and, and, and the great sculptors and writers, they had nothing. Mm -hmm. And they made the most beautiful things you could imagine, more than we could even dream of. So those kind of, what I'm getting at, I guess, is what makes you who you are. Mm. And it's diversity, it's, it's hardship, it's, it's things that are tough and things that are not easy like today. Not easy when you press a button and get an answer. Not easy when you look at a screen and get all the information you need. You're never gonna learn how to dig a ditch by watching it on TV or watching on your screen. You have to take the shovel and do it. Right. And those kinds of things that I grew up with from the, the rough and tumble stuff that my mother and father went through and that I don't even remember having one toy when I was a kid, and I don't even—I only remember that because I saw a picture of it. So I, I don't remember any of that stuff of coddling, and so I just had knew knew that we had family, that we were loved, that the that the love came from a mother and a father and a brothers and uncles, and uh, all that rumble tough stories that are lacking today. 
you you don't have you don't have it now you have psychiatrists taking care of those problems you have you know we've become delicate we are we are pampered we are we are not uh, so everything everything is now i mean if you even take this this golden globe thing that's on the news today yeah. the diversity they want 50% they're talking about of diversity 50% when a a, a uh, nationality of, of uh, the black community is thirteen percent of the of the country, thirteen percent. Now you wouldn't believe that, according to our our uh, commercials and and uh, television shows and what have you. You wouldn't believe it was thirteen percent. And we know Barack Hussein Obama was elected twice, not by thirteen percent of the population. But 87% of the population that were white folks. So where's the racism there? Right. So the, the, the idea is that this idea of this country being a racist country is absolutely absurd. So uh, to force a, I know I've gotten off, I've gotten okay. off and gotten right into to this okay. situation. But, <laughs> okay. but I'm just, I'm just try, trying to talk common sense and logic. And I know those two words are foreign words. They have no, no place apparently anymore in the English language, common sense and logic and history and, and facts. Those, those, are not, those, are, those are words that do not exist anymore. So yeah. that's where we've come. But the idea of going back to how uh, I became an actor basically or a person uh, is, is all that I have that warehouse, that warehouse of of uh, communication, the warehouse of, of seeing. We as artists, as actors, uh, as performers, we see beyond what is seen. Mm. You understand? Mm. That's what we see, that's who we are. That's how we create, that's how you get your humor because you see beyond what's seen the, and, you, and, and that's, what we, that's what we do. And that comes from a, a, a uh, a knowledge of uh, stories and histories from from using your imagination, something that is, seems to have gone away from because because you see back then there was radio. Mm. Well, what did radio mean? It mean it meant that you have to use your imagination. When the radio was was talking. When people were talking, you are now creating pictures. You are now creating the the, the whole scene, and now they're telling, they're showing you the whole thing. You see the picture, you see the thing, and they're telling you the story. Now your imagination gets stopped. So anyway, I've been forced. What I'm getting at, I guess, is is I'm I'm getting at that that hardship is not something to become a victim of. Hardship is what to learn from and be grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm, I was happy and always been happy for the what's more difficult. Mm, that's like a challenge. The, yeah, challenge is always, always the, the most important thing to be challenged, to overcome. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what conflict is, that's what action is. I can, there's no action if I just put my hands like this. There's no action, maybe the air. But if I do that, I've just made action. I just made action, and that's what and that's what the uh, movie's about. It's what life is about. Right, right. And uh, so that's what you grow from. So I, I somehow, when I went to the movies and getting up and paying eight cents to go to a movie back then, uh, as a matter of fact, when one time when they raised the price till about uh, I think ten cents or twelve cents, I didn't have the extra money. Mm. And it was a man standing there and he put in the extra pennies for me to go to the movies. And I remember that constantly. And that kind of remembrance, when I'm on a line going, checking out a store or something, and I'm always looking to the woman or the man in front of me who's going through the purse. And if they don't have the money, believe me, I'm paying for it. That impacted your whole life. That's, yeah. that's incredible. I yeah. just, I want to just, um, to your point before, because um, you start to talk about diversity. I, I knew exactly where you were going. 
I also grew up in the city. And by the way, you're saying a long, long time ago. So I am a long time ago. So I get, <laughs> I, I get it. Okay. I get it. Um, and it, it pains me because we're both New Yorkers. We both love this city. We both love this country. Uh, I too had a big family, a big extended, I have two sisters, but I had a big extended family. Aunts and uncles and cousins mean everything to me. Uh, now that we're grown up, I'm godmother. You know, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it's sad. Some people, listen, some people just don't have that family unit. Their family just isn't that big. And that's that's one thing. That's another thing. Although although my aunt, my aunt always said, who's a school teacher, you can never spoil children with enough love. You know, you can never, you know, you can never overflow the love. Um, and then, and then some people ha do have big families and they're disjointed, but you have to have some structure. And sometimes, you know what, sometimes the parents can't do it or they split up or whatever the reason is, and nobody's judging, but you need some, some parental strong unit. I mean, there are people that are incredibly successful that were raised by their grandparents or their grandmother. That's, I always, I love those stories. Those are amazing. And I had wonderful, I had parents, but I had wonderful grandparents. I mean, everybody plays a role. So mm. I completely agree. And I feel so, like for some reason, and maybe I'm off record, but, or, or, you know, off the mark, but for some reason, I feel like that was much more of a priority back when we were growing up than it is now. I think people really, and, and I, I am not a parent, so I'm speak, I realize how I'm speaking, but it is, it really is so, it's, it, that's why I get very frustrated when I see, and again, I'm go, really going off the mark, when I see celebrities having their child, you know, having a child and then kids, teenage girls wanting to copy it and whatever, it's a completely different thing. It is the most important thing you will ever do is to have children. And whatever your situation is, you don't have to have millions of dollars, but you have to give them some stability. And I think we have that. And we also, which is interesting in New York City, that's why I am perplexed about a, a little bit about what's going on, because it's like, wait a minute, I grew up in diversity. I don't remember all of this. I'm not saying that there were the Italians, the Irish, the, you know, I'm not saying none of that, but, but it has reached this, this, this violent, horrific level um, I felt like we were all trying to go come together for a common cause where now it's just like everybody is for themselves. So I completely agree with you. I feel like we used to get along and now based on politicians and media and all kinds of things, they've made us fight. I always say that. I say, guys, don't listen to everything. You know, mm. and everybody's accountable. Who's blaming this one? Who's blaming that one? And again, like when we were brought up, work accountability, be responsible for yourself. Just those very core values are, are, are definitely missing. Technology on one hand, great. I need something, cha, 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 cha. I got a shop, cha, 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 cha. But on the other hand, there's a dark web out there that's evil. <laughs> and like you said, you know, even just to read a book now is, is a completely different thing than just to go and, and uh, you know, to read something really quick. Our, we've all developed ADD. Like our attention span is very, very, very short. So I completely agree with you. And um, we were lucky to have that fam that, that kind of a family unit. And, and uh, I love what you said about imagination. So when you were a kid, were you, were you an observer of your family and just kind of watching everybody's nuances and, and, and things, mannerisms? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a key to creativity, I think. Uh, ob observation and the uh, to be uh, sensitive and and strong, uh, having a combination of both, uh, being able to decipher uh, what somebody really means by what they say mm. or what they do, mm. and behavior. Behavior is is really acting. You know the words the words come out of of uh, experience. You have to speak. And uh, it's not just talk. You have to, you, you it's, a, it's a, the idea of speaking comes from the feeling and the thought process of what's coming out. So, and I think that is a, another uh, aspect of, of what's wrong with us. We, we uh, just 
fly off the handle without any responsibility of what you're saying. And, uh, <clears throat> and we, I think we've taken this whole idea of America and freedom into a wrong place. When a policeman stops you and says, pull over, get out of the car or stand up and put your hands where it belongs, you obey the police officer. If you, if you think he's doing something wrong about saying those things to you, you will take it up later, not then. You, you obey an order from, a, from authority and respect. That's the word seems to be gone. Respect. Totally. My father was a big, <laughs> big respect. Yeah. You know, um, it, uh, you know, the, uh, um, I'm going to talk about the Oscars. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say one thing about respect. Yeah. You know, I see sometimes as well, um, that definitely is something that's lost with adults and with kids. And I think we don't tell the kids enough. And I, unfortunately, I see it sometimes in my own family and I'm like, if we spoke to our aunts and uncles like that, uh, forget it. So I just want to make sure I make that point. And the kids have become very beholden. Not that there aren't any good kids, but I think, again, some of these very, very simple things need to be, um, uh, you know, need, need to be retaught. Re but uh, to get to Absolutely. acting and to, uh, to the Golden Globes and to Oscars and, and to you, because you've been in this business 50 years, dare I say, 60 years, dare I say. Oh, look at that. 67. How about 67? 67 years, dare my I baby say. Just, my baby just came off. Oh, <laughs> baby's on TV. Yes, cute, cute. Um, <laughs> you know, you've seen such yeah. transformation in this business. I mean, what do you, what, I know this is a loaded question, but what is, yeah, what, no. what do you think the sort of the biggest difference is of, of like when you started? And, 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 and sort of how it's evolved now. I know, huge, <laughs> wow. huge. That is, that is night and day. <laughs> that is night and day. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> integrity, class, um, uh, respect, big, big word, uh, respect. Um, and uh, right. the idea, you know, back, back, and I go, I'll go even before I got into the business, but... <clears throat> because I, I, you, you have to look at history. You know I mean? I was talking about looking at history. Well, you have to know what you're doing from, from, from history. And when you look back to the uh, group theater, which is where Harold Klerman, uh, Kazan, um, uh, 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 Strasburg and so on, those people came from. <clears throat> and when the group theater was, it was about theater not television, not movies. Mm. In fact, movies, I don't think television was even existed then, but, but movies were considered commercial, considered you don't do movies, you, you're a legitimate actor. It's like being a legitimate person, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so you, theater was, was, the, was the, the, the mark. And so, and you were considered an actor if you did theater and, uh, and not movies. So when John Garfield and Frank Chateau, way back names people don't even know, went to move to movies, they were considered sellouts. And so, and then eventually uh, they were doing good movies and, and uh, 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 movies that meant something to society. Uh, and so it gravitated, yes, that more actors went to do movies. And, and then came the, thing called television. And this thing, television, uh, was as commercial as you can possibly get. So you see the deterioration. They call it, they pro call it progress, but however, <laughs> it's a deterioration of the original thought. Mm. And that's probably true of America as well. <laughs> the deterioration <laughs> totally. of the original thought. <laughs> totally. Yeah, so it's, it's mm -hmm. happened in and, uh, uh, and it keeps happening. And when the, when the ball rolls down the hill, it picks up all the garbage that was there and it's coming, whether it's the, the, the sick 60s or go, and going back, you know, after, and I keep jumping around here, but after World War II, after World War II, 
I mean, believe me, during World War II, as a kid, I was roaming the streets, picking up cigarette boxes, because back then, and cigarette, it didn't have to be boxes, but back then, the cigarettes were covered with a silver paper that had to be taken off, you know? Now, for the war effort, you see, people back then were sacrificing their pots and pans, mm. their coffee pots, to, to, for the war so they could make weapons to fight the war. People were all involved as a whole country involved giving of themselves to fight a, uh, an enemy of Germany and Japan. So, uh, so we, and I made a ball about that big, the size of a softball uh, of the silver paper and kept finding off the streets and making the ball to give to the, for the army to, to make um, ammunition out of it. And <clears throat> those kind of thoughts and, and of for country are gone. Mm -hmm. They have now been, you see, uh, they have now been replaced by what we're talking through. Uh, you know, I, I know Eat and everybody cannot live without their cell phone. And thank God for that. We wouldn't know how to get anywhere. And we'd still be writing down to make a left, make a right turn here, <laughs> see a tree. Yes, you know, we'd be writing directions down. Uh, and that's a blessing. However, the Frankenstein monster lives. What I mean by that, for those who don't even know what Frankenstein is, except for the, the funny movie. Went back in the original Frankenstein, Peter Lorre, Boris Karloff was Boris Karloff was the was the monster they put together. Peter Lorre would steal body parts for uh, I think John Carradine and give them to him, and he'd put this body together, and he made this creature, this automatic creature that was fulfilled with electronics that went through his neck and made a person. Well, that monster that was created by Doctor Frankenstein wound up killing Dr. Frankenstein, which is what we're doing now. Mm. Our creation are now killing the, our, us. They're, yes, they're seemingly helping us, but they're putting people out of work. They're replacing the human being with robots. They're replacing they're doing all kinds of things that, that are too fast for society to adjust to. And they can't, they don't have the, the manpower. I mean, I, they don't, the, the, the manpower, the, the techni technical stuff is replacing the man, uh, manpower so fast, you see. So anyway, um, I keep wanting to get back. I, you know, I've been to Europe many, many, many times where, the, where you see beauty, where you see art, where you see sculpture, where you see buildings that have been up for thousand years or more. They're still standing. They're still beautiful. They're, they've been made with tools that you wouldn't even be able to, uh, our people today, humans, wouldn't even be able to know how to do anything with. They made the most beautiful architecture you could imagine. And it's still standing. We have garbage. We made buildings 20 years ago that are collapsing. Mm. And we, we've gotten the mind of art. So twisted, so uh, accommodating for the simple mind that we now have of appreciation. We put up buildings with square buildings with things, things like, like open drawers sticking out. We call it yeah. art. Yeah. We call that build art, architecture. Art. Go to Europe. See what the beauty of, of architecture really is. When people had nothing and created it out of their guts, out of their, out of their vision, out of, out of their beauty, that's beauty. This is we've destroyed. We've destroyed the word art. Somebody taking a pail of paint, and throwing it against the campus, and and saying, "Oh, look what I did." You know, I, I, I put, look what I did. some fool bought a banana on a wall just recently for what a couple of hundred thousand dollars. We have lost our minds. You understand? I want to get to. I want. That's a great point because I, I want to get to art in terms of television and film and things that you've been involved in music. I I got to tell you, I um, I, it, well, since the lock, the, the locked, since, you know, the gyms had closed and everything, I used to go work out at a dance studio and I love it. I love movement. I love dance and it, but I couldn't stand the music. Tony, it was so vile. 
<laughs> it, and by the way, I'm a comedian. I have a high tolerance for language. It's not like I, you know, I, and I'm a New Yorker, so it's not like I never say anything. But yeah. oh my goodness, it yeah. is foul, yeah. foul. The music is disgusting. I hate rap. I don't, and they go rap artist. It's, it is so, it is so bad. It is, it is, and I feel like a lot of that music and a lot of those artists are, are a big part of the problem and have incited violence. Mm -hmm. So I, that, and that breaks my heart. Cause when I was a kid, I used to put records on. I used to just, we talk about imagination, you know, just by myself, I would dance in the living room. I, that, that makes there's a lot of people that do that they put music on and they dance it makes you happy we should try to find whatever it you know whatever those few things are that yeah. make us happy and they have bastardized it and they've turned it into a, a statement and a, a cop hating this and a this and i privilege that and i yeah. so so now i act so you know obviously we we had the quarantine all the gyms it's closed down. I was like, well, I got to work out because because I've been working out for years and I'm used to it. So I found some online and at least the music is just like house music type of thing. There's no words, so it's fine. Uh, mm. But although even the beats to some of those. But anyway, that's just like one section of of art that is horrible. Movies, TV, everything has a freaking statement. I just want to be entertained. I just want to laugh. I want to keep it. I don't want to hear it. And and you know, even in, in certain shows, sitcoms, they always got to make a dig, some kind of subtlety, some kind of, I don't care, make it funny, make it about characters, make it about people's quirks, say funny things to each other. It's really been very disappointing. And I'm like, and I'm an actress, like I want to do that, but I get very, it gets very, very upsetting. Movies, very violent, hugely violent. Everything is violent. It's, how is this relaxing? I leave and I'm, I, I stop, I'm, I'm done watching and I'm more tense than I was yeah. before I started. Yeah. So how do you yeah. feel about that? I mean, <laughs> <clears throat> well, you know, it's very difficult to be talking about history and, and even the way I'm, I talk because people uh, have, have been born into it. Mm -hmm. Mm. And they don't know the difference. Right. So it may be like, I may be, to, to most people, I may be sounding like it's a foreign language. See? And, and the idea is, you can disagree with me, you see. However, uh, you, don't have, you don't have a frame of reference. I have a frame of reference. Right. Because right. of history. Right. They, when I talk about uh, plays... They're watch people today are watching reruns. They're watching redos. I've seen the original. Right. So my knowledge is history. And, and that is where it starts. And so the idea of the people who have been born into television or, or, or thing that we're looking through now or what's all this technical stuff have no idea what I'm talking about. You see? Because they don't know, they don't just uh, have, uh, don't have the information, and um, and so they can disagree on their terms because they don't know. That's all they know, and uh, that's unfortunate. And uh, that's unfortunate because what they're seeing now, or what they're dealing with now, has nothing to do with with uh, uh, reality. I mean, it, it could be a re, it's a reality that they have now, but it's it's not it's not the truth. And I have encountered many many people who I've spoken to who feel the absolute opposite of what I'm talking about politically, socially, and what have you. It's we have gotten to a point now where the arts and the music. And I mean, I am like you. Rap music is I, I can't I can't even hear a note right. to listen to any of that garbage, any of that. And people call well, that's their language. That's that's that, that's how they're communicating. Well, so is graffiti. You know, the same way now they everything we cannot control in this country, we make legal. 
We are so stupid. It's unbelievable. They just, look, they just had a marijuana parade. How, how, and, how, and how do you like not, smelling pot when you go outside? How do you like that? That's, yeah. Where's my rights? I don't want to smell it. I don't want right. to inhale it. What, where are my rights? Right. I completely agree with you on that. Right. And look all, all, all of it, but. Yeah, they had a marijuana parade yeah. celebrating the legalization of marijuana and they're stopping the, the, vets. the, the veterans for Memorial Day. Yep. How is that? For an example, does anybody even see that that is absolutely wrong? You know, I mean, how, how can you not see that? I mean, that's where we're at though. We're at a, that situation and, and, and things like, you know, what Biden did in terms coming in and stopping the pipeline. How do you do that? Well, I just had, I went to get gas yesterday, a couple of days ago, excuse me. Four, over four dollars and twenty cents. Well, what, what does that mean to anybody? Does that doesn't matter any? Then and now somebody's telling me there could be a gas shortage. That the talk that, about talk about history, the seventies. Talk yeah, about history. Yeah. Itself. Yeah. I don't mean to say, make that funny. I'm just saying it's it's just it's I I, I listen. I you, I completely agree. There are so many things we haven't learned from our mistakes. Yeah. Um, we, the, the world really does feel very, very upside down. Vi vi virus as aside, virus aside, it was happening. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for you, for people like you and I that are performers and that also just feel a certain way and to be ostracized for that way. Why? Because I like low taxes. First of all, before, <laughs> I, before I became a, an actress and a comedian, I used to be a CPA. So if you want to talk economics, then let's throw it down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because stop with this. We should pay for everything. Thing. Nothing's for free. <laughs> Google Milton Friedman. Uh, you know, enough already with this. I mean, we've just completely gone off the rails. You can't say anything. And you know what? Since we're on the topic and you're Italian American, I'm a Greek American. We knew our grandparents, our parents and all this. When somebody talks about the white privilege, at least to me, okay, I can't speak about the Kennedys or the Bushes or <laughs> are people like you and I, okay? Right. It's like, are you shitting me? I mean, are you, are you kidding? My grandfather was a waiter. My grandmother was a seamstress. My other grandparents ran a, a 24 hour coffee shop. I mean, my parents broke their necks. I mean, I, I break my back. I, what, what, the, what, I, I mean, I, they have, they, the media uh, and, and, and actors and actresses that are incredibly wealthy that sit on a throne and pontificate. That's why, just to get back to Golden Globes, we're, we're very good here at Karis's Corner, uh, Karis's Comedy Corner about circling back. You know, I read it yesterday and I go, good, gala, it's good in Greek, gala. I said, you deserve it. Nobody's watching it anymore. Tony, this is the first time in my life, in my yeah. life that I can remember that I didn't watch the Academy Awards. It was disgusting. I, what, what am I gonna watch it for? So you can tell me what I'm doing wrong as a person? Are you kidding me? I mean, the hypocrisy, I, the hypocrisy. I, I watch the Academy Awards. I always watch things that I so because I have to talk about them. I have to have. I'm sorry. Have you ever been to the Academy Awards? Have you ever been was, to any of the awards? I was awards offered shows? to go and I didn't go. Oh, no okay. Time. okay. Yeah, <laughs> but I've never been. Um, even even when I had the French Connection. Right, uh, right, right. That's well, why I'm asking. It was my first or my second movie, so I don't who the heck who. You know, <laughs> you know. But okay. anyway, the idea of of the Academy Award, I watched it all all the way through, which was a very brave thing to do because I don't know anybody else who did. <laughs> and I knew that it would have the lowest in the soda. It was such a racist Academy Awards. I've never seen, I've never seen, it was so awful. It's so, it was disgusting. It was truly disgusting. And when I say racist, you know, I'm talking about anti, anti opposite of what usually people usually call racism, you know? And uh, it, was, it was really more of a, a, a black Academy Awards, basically, uh, and, and the idea of them putting uh, uh, laws or whatever you want to call them on conditions on making movies, you have to have a, now they're asking for 50% diversity. 50, how do you make a movie? What do you mean you got to make a movie that has to have black content or, or indigenous content or, or people have to be hired? Uh, so many people and so many actors have to have a, a particular, what, what are you talking about?
How can I, can I make a Hamlet anymore? Can I do Shakespeare? Can I do, what, what, what are you talking about? Can, can Marlon Brando play Sayonara, playing an, an Asian? Can Laurence Olivier play uh, Othello as a black man? Can it, you mean that's all out? They, that, well, acting is gone. Now we're just casting typecasting. And I mean, we're having, we're having things. I mean, as an actor, I prepare a role for every hand movement. I prepare a role for every costume that I'm gonna wear, of every, what I'm gonna, that's artist, artistry at work is what acting is supposed to be. But now they have, an, now you can have a four white children come into a room and their mother come in, who is black. And you're not supposed to see that as an audience. You're not supposed to wait for the uh, information about that coming up in the play. You mean that's not disturbing? It's not, it's not take you out of the play? Not, it doesn't make you think of something else? Of course it does. You're not a fool. You're not a fool. You, you have to, you have to every, everything you're, you're dealing with it within two, within two hours, whether it's on the stage or in the movie, you, you've crystallized life. Mm -hmm. And so every move that you make, every cut that you make as a director, every long shot, everything that you make, every actor you pick, is adding to the story that you're going to tell in this short period of time about a whole lifetime. And you're telling me that I, I got to change, you got to put a, 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 a black person or a yellow person or a green person or a white person what, in these different parts because it has to do with uh, uh, fairness. This is not, this is art. We're talking about folks' art. Right. I don't, I don't mind, I, I don't mind. You know, of course, I think the roles should be cast according to what is best for the, for the role. All right. um, and I, I mean, you know, if there's a, uh, let's just say sitcom, for example, because I love sitcoms, uh, you know, and it's a uh, black family and it's a mother, and the, that's great. Is it funny? Is it funny? If it's funny, everybody's quirky, blah, blah, blah. You get, you get um, committed to the characters. Same thing with the drama and all that. That's great. That's fine. That's fantastic. I can't, I, that's not the, the issue. What, so what, what's bothering, what bothers me sometimes is when I go to watch a movie, uh, there's the racial component, but not, not just like, like, you know how Italians, like, you know, you make fun, Greeks, you make fun. It's not even like that. It's it's sort of like this hatred for everybody else. And it's just like, why is something, why do we have to go there? Why does everything have to get politicized? Why can't it just yeah. be about telling a story? We all struggle. We all have stories. That's totally fine. And if, and if, and if that works better with a black actor, that's fine too. If that's their story, that's totally fine. Great. We're all Great. about fairness. Absolutely. But, but, but my, my thing is that I just feel that we, we veered off and now everything is about making this, again, this, you know, this statement and then talking about what happened in 1619 and about, and then it's on and on. It's like, I got it. Do you know what my niece said to me the other day? My niece is in junior high school, uh, excuse me, uh, she's a junior and she, she, I swear to God, and again, I, I'm just about being a good human being. That's all. And she's on her third course of critical race theory. And she goes, oh, to me, God. She goes to me, I learned about slavery in the third grade. I got it. I'm done. I'm done. And and I don't, I, we won't even get into what they, they're saying to the kids and what they're making them say and all that. I won't even get into that here. But, you know, we've gotten off the rails. They're making us not get, want to get, I, I want to get along with everybody. You want to get along with everybody, but they're making it, they're causing dissension. Yeah. They're causing, and, 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 and art is, was the first place as is sports, as a, you know, as a yeah. sport. I mean, I, not that I was a big sports person, but I can't watch anything now. Everything before you get to the game, there's 72 political statements. I, I don't want that. Right. So, so I, and you know, for you and I as actors and loving performing and storytelling, and it's heartbreaking to, to, to kind of see all that, you know, that those are the commercial successes. Um, I, I do, I, we, we've been talking a lot. I definitely want to get to your work. Uh, one of what the, is that? what is that? 
Um, one of the works that I, first of all, you've worked on the French Connection. Let's just talk about that for, for just, can we give that like a minute? Um, Gene Hackman, uh, I, I mean, what was that experience like and how did you get that audition? I, I have to, I've been dying to ask you this question. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, when I was in New York uh, in the 60s, uh, I started a theater called the Triangle Theater. Uh, and it was a free theater for the public and nobody got paid. The actors didn't get paid or anything, but it was a, we had some wonderful stuff. We discovered great people like Jason Miller, mm. the writer. Uh, he was our playwright. We did all his plays at our theater before he won the Pulitzer Prize at the, the champ, uh, uh, championship season. Uh, he did that play. And then we had Roy Scheider, my buddy, uh, Oh, talked about French Connection and others. He he played in Jason's play. He was one of the actors in in, in there, and uh, and Jason was married to uh, at that time. He was married to Jackie Gleason's daughter, Linda. Yeah, uh, and uh, it was it, it was a great great experience. We did it for four years, I believe, four or five years, and we had did everything there. We did uh, we had art in the back of the theater, it was, it was in a church. It was in the church on 88th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue, 316, I believe, uh, 88th Street, right up from Elaine's, right? Or <laughs> Elaine's. Yeah, and uh, it was a lovely, it was a lovely, we built it. We built it, we did everything, uh, the stage, what have you. It was a room a friend of mine, God rest his sister, just, just passed, Stephen Chinlin, he was a priest. And he was in that church, Church of the Holy Trinity. And that, uh, he, he said, how'd you like to have a theater in this room? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we built the stadium, borrowed. This is the kind of thing. We borrowed $5,000 from the church. And we said, we're going to give it back to you. We're going to just charge donations. And so we built stage, lighting board, lights, and did three productions all for five thousand dollars wow and and we had uh, joseph elisi who's our costume designer we got him from uh, ann roth who just won an academy award but who's, who's won many academy awards i called her out of the blue and i said ann how'd you like to come and do the costumes i mean this is a this is a academy award winning she said, well, Tony, I'm a little busy. <laughs> ah! She said, well, I'll send you over one of my protégés. So send over Joe Alisi. And we would get to do things from, he'd go to uh, Salvation Army and then we'd do period plays. He'd get these costumes and we worked. Everybody worked hard. And what we did was, was include the community. We went to the stores and said, listen, we need that chair. Or we need that couch. Uh, here's four tickets, five tickets, it was free anyway. But it's 10, 6, 10, 16, whatever the hell you want. Went to ABC, props. Imagine I went in and I said, I need a couch, I need this. And they gave it to us. People were different human beings in the 60s, in our group anyway. Uh, and the way we approached them, you know, we approached them because it was family. We approached them because it was neighborhood. And the, and the, and the theater was free for them to come and get culture, to learn, to learn a lesson and not two plus. The first two plays we put on were uh, the zoo story, uh, uh, Edward Albee, the zoo story. And the second play was the, 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 the case of Monsieur Patelin, 500 years difference in playwriting. Mm. One was a period piece mm. and the other was a modern piece. And what we have is the, the, the priest would, would give the sermon about the subject matter of the plays that we're dealing with. And then he'd say, go see the play. Mm. So it was acted out in terms of the, of the mental thing. And we had picked the plays that way with the church. And that's why it was called the Triangle Theater, that's which was the nice. church, the theater, and the audience, that triangle. And so there was purpose behind it all. And, and we cultivated Richard Lynch was one of our actors, Roy Scheider, Jason Miller, uh, Bert Brinkerhoff was my partner. He and I put the, the theater together. Uh, we did art shows in the back, paintings all over the place. We had, we were way ahead of our time because we had live art. People were their art. 
in, in back then, way back in the 60s, where they, they would do something and they'd stand there for an hour, you know, expressing whatever they emote. I mean, and, and paintings Lola. So <clears throat> it was a cultural, a culture. We did operas. We did operas. We did everything you could imagine. We did at this theater. And one day, an actress friend of mine said, you know, they're auditioning for a movie. You should go really go up for it. And this is in the 60s, mind you. So I've been already acting since 1954. Uh, didn't, my, didn't do my first movie until 1968. So that's 14 years in the theater before I did my first film. And so I went up for this thing and I, I'll make a long story short because I want to get to French Connection. You asked me that question. And it, <clears throat> It turned out after a much ado, not the story, but uh, I got uh, uh, Honeymoon Killers with Shirley Stola. And that was my first film. And then as a result of the Honeymoon Killers, <clears throat> both William Friedkin, the director of French Connection, and Philip D'Antoni, the producer, was one of their favorite films. Then they watched the movie. And one of them said, let's get him for Sal Boca in the, in the French Connection. And the other one said he's Spanish. He's got a Spanish accent. I'm using a Spanish accent in the movie. He other, happened to be the casting guy. And he said, no, no, he's a New York actor. He doesn't have an accent. And that's how I got the part. Oh my gosh. And that is, is you know, it's, 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 it's always by a hair. Right, it's always right. Hair. And that's how that happened. And then I became very good friends with Sonny Grasso, you know, the, the, the real live detective that Roy played mm -hmm. and Eddie Egan, which is the, the, uh, the, the one that Gene Hackman played. <clears throat> but that experience was again, family. That experience was people who got along, even on, on when we play basketball together uh, at night, uh, we'd go play and we play against, uh, see, we, we go play against uh, uh, Exorcist when that was being shot. Uh, later on, when, when, when we were doing pre uh, Seven Ups, right after that, Exorcist was being shot in and, and New York as well. And we would play with Jason. Uh, Jason would play basketball games at night uh, while in you know, the daytime. We'd send each other, uh, you know, wreaths or things of, of uh, joking. We had this great r rapport uh, with, with each other. And, and uh, again, family, again, family. That is the so important thing of getting along. And I, this will bring me to the current movie. I'm, I'm just finished. Actually, I finished, they're still shooting. But <clears throat> I'm, I've just finished the movie for Friday. Today is Monday. Um, just finished this movie with uh, Raymond, Ray, Ray Romano. Ray Romano. And Sebastian Maniscalco if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and Laurie Metcalf. Oh, wow. Now, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a one hell of a cast. Yeah, she's, and it's a, quite she's a, a good actress. Mm -hmm. She's a really good actress. Yeah, too. They're all good actors. So what happened was that this uh, audition uh, kind of thing, because I hadn't been doing much lately, and they wanted to see what I looked like, uh, if I was still alive or... <laughs> or yeah, you know, I can remember a word or two, you know what I mean? Wait, hang, so, hang on a second. You look amazing, by the way. You, are, I, I, I've known you for over 10 years and you have not changed one bit. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> well, uh, on top of that, uh, you know, that's, that's the deal. I'm, I'm, uh, in October, this coming October, I will be 85. Now, that is amazing to me, even. <laughs> I'm very vital, as a matter of fact. And, and uh, in fact, on the set of, with Ray, they said to me, what's your secret? What, what do you do? What is <laughs> you right, know, that right. kind of wonderful thing? So, uh, in fact, I'm going to write a book about it. Please, <laughs> you know? please, yeah. please. I beg of you, please. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's getting to be ridiculous. My, my wife. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean it's decent. embarrassing that it's so. You're so. You're. You're. So <laughs> <laughs> my wife said, "You cannot get younger than me." That's my wife said, "Wait a minute, you cannot get younger than me." <laughs> my beautiful wife. I, th you uh, know, I think it's a lot. I think it's a lot of things, but I think one of, I think it's a couple things. Knowing what I know of you, 
It's, um, it's your compassion and your love for, for humanity. Uh, it's your, I think it's your patriotism. And also you really did find, uh, they always say, find what you love to do and then figure out a way to get paid for it. And you right. you've you been doing that for a long time. So that's right. That's I right. Cause I never, felt like that. Mm -hmm. I never felt a day in my life. I never felt a day in my life that I had, I worked. That's so you know, great. to me, it's not work. Uh, to me, it's it's what I do in life is not work. I don't even even when I'm out there, like I, I'm. I don't know if you see my background here. I'm in my home in, in Maryland, and I have a. I have turned into to the earth, basically. <laughs> I'm, I have a lot of a wood. <laughs> you know, a lot of wood, a lot of trees, a lot of so on and so forth. Picking up. I just just yesterday, I just did with my guy here. We just put all the hay on my garden, which is 105 feet by 70 feet. Wow. So I plant everything and, I, and it's not work for me. In fact, I'm dressed now, as you can see, after we finish, I'm going right out there and I'm going, to, I'm going to be planting tomatoes, you know? And that is a joy. People say that's work, I went on. Not hurt work to me. I, I love everything that I do or else I wouldn't do it. Uh, first of all, I, that's, very, that's very Italian, okay, to plant tomatoes. <laughs> so yeah. number one. I, I, everything in a, my little greenhouse, I planted <laughs> everything you can dream of. Oh, it's it's going to go into the ground this year. So and, I, I, and I can't wait for it to grow and other people can. I, we love to entertain it. Yeah. We love to make our, I make my own sauce. Of course I you do. I wouldn't think sauce. anything less. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so we, you know, we, we, my, you know, I've got, we got plans, we're, we're putting a, what are we doing, a, uh, people getting married, what, what do you call that party you do? The reception? The reception before the, before the wedding. We got we to gotta do a big thing, I don't know, 60, 70 people I cook for, you know, that kind of thing. I do all the cooking, make the meatballs and make the everything, uh, you know, the, the, the eggplant parmesan, my own eggplant. Anyway, I'll, I'll make it back to let me go back. Okay. To well, excuse me. I expect an, I expect an invitation. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. okay. Now the other thing, the other thing that I'm talking about, Ray, the movie. Yes, uh, please. The un, it's an untitled movie at the moment. Okay. And it takes place in Queens, where Ray is from. Yes. We shot it in Queens, and uh, uh, they it used to be called Mr. Russo, and now it's got Ray wants a, 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 the name Queens in the title somehow. So. My my dear dear friend, you know uh, Dina Martin, Dean Martin's daughter, mm -hmm. Dina Martin. Yes, wonderful. great friend of ours. We're great. trying actually. Uh, you know, it's funny. I need to get her on the show. She was on my list. All right. Because I know her manager, so yeah, yeah uh, we have to get her on the list. Yeah, she's, mm -hmm. she's uh, John Griffith. John Griffith is her husband, and works works with. But they, we speak to them every day. Mm -hmm. That's how close we are. Well, I had her put on the show. Uh, as a matter of fact, you might want to do it too. A contest of naming Ray's movie. Oh! So you put it out to your viewers, and oh. she did that just the last Friday. She has right. a show. She's she's been doing a show every Friday uh, for this last Friday was the sixtieth week. Sixtieth week, she sings for uh, thirty five minutes. Does does a show, and it's, she's now what, number three in the world on the chart. Wow, she's number three in the world. So, so she's and she's getting like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people a day uh, tuning in. Uh, maybe three, four, five hundred from all over the world. So the number three that she is uh, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, she so they so got this little contest going. We'll see what happens with next next Friday. I, I told Ray about. It. He said, "Great, good, do it." <laughs> So, so if anybody wants to name the movie, it's about a Queens family. Ray thinks it should have the name Queens in it, uh, in the title. And uh, it, it, it's, a, again, family. Uh, and so what role are you? What, what role are you in? I play his father. I'm oh, Pops. that's Pops a huge Russo. role. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I play Ray and, and Sebastian's father. They're, they're brothers. both my son. They're, right, they're brothers. They're brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Laurie Metcalf is Ray's wife, mm -hmm. and, and it is about. He, I own a construction company called Russo Construction, and uh, my boys both work for me. As do as do my grandsons, uh, Sebastian's two two boys, and and Ray's boy is a is come of age to work with us, but he plays basketball, 
and there's a possibility that he will go get a scholarship at college and not come and work for us. Now, Ray is a bit of an airhead in this, in this piece. He's, his mind is elsewhere, and he's not a very good worker, although Sebastian is my right hand. And uh, so there's that conflict in this piece, and it is, uh, uh, there's, there's many wonderful things in there. And the little, the boy, young, young handsome kid, uh, has a girlfriend, and she's a gal who played in some Disney movie recently, like a superstar Disney gal. I don't even know what it was. Any these things escaped my mind. So uh, I, how, uh, how, I have to ask how it was working with them. I've never met Ray. However, in 2013, I did a show down in New Jersey, uh, uh, Uncle Vinny's Comedy Club in Point Pleasant. And I'll never forget, it was just one night, uh, it was a Saturday night with two shows. And I remember the owner of the club said, um, you know, when he called, he's like, uh, can you come down, da, 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 you know, working with Sebastian Maniscalco. And to tell you the truth, I, I had never heard of him before. Mm -hmm. So I go down and place was packed and they didn't, it, it's really a restaurant with a stage. So the green room was, is like, was Dino's office. So, ba you know, basically you'd sit on the side. So anyway, we're in the office. I met Sebastian. He was very nice. And, uh, but he was, he was very intense, which, which I, I listen to him now. I listen to his podcast and whatever, which exactly what I thought of him was exactly kind of how, how he was. And he was very focused. He was friendly. He was nice. He was professional, you know, really great, but he was very focused. And so mm -hmm. I remember him saying to me, you know, I was like, Hey, how you doing? I go, oh, you're Italian. I'm Greek. I go, this is good. And, you know, we do a lot, you know, ethnic stuff. He's like, okay, good. Okay, good. You're Italian, Greek. Okay. So you're going to do 20 and then I'm going to come on. You're going to introduce me. And then we're going to do the second show. He was very like methodical. So then right. the office, I'm like, okay, again, very nice. And, but I got the vibe. I said, you know what? Let me give him his space. This isn't a guy that wants the schmooze. This is, you know, so I let, you know, I walked out and I'm in the back of the restaurant, whatever. So I get up, I do my, I do my thing. Great audience. I introduce him. And uh, <clears throat> so we're in the back and he's doing his thing and he's very physical, but this, but it's, it, this, there's no state. I mean, it's like this big, you know, so he's sort of making some movements, but anyway, they loved him. And in the back of the room, the owner says to me, he goes, this is the last time I'm going to be able to get him in a place like this. Cause it's like, I don't know, 60 seats, 80 seats. And I'm like, yeah, why? And he goes, because he just booked, he's booked for Atlantic city, the big theater. He goes, so this is it. I can never get him here again. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay. And then the next week he was at Gotham and it was on page six and Seinfeld was there. And you know, Chris Mazzilli, who owns that great guy, you know, they all, I, I mean, I don't know his whole trajectory and everything. Uh, he's been working a long time. He's busted his hump. He deserves everything that he gets. He is funny. He is clean. I love his humor. Right. I can listen to him all day. And, right. you know, I didn't realize it at the time, you know, that I was good. I was, I got to work with really one of the great comedians. Um, and I know he's done some movies. He was in green, uh, the green book, um, you know, and I know they tried to do a sitcom with Tony's Danda. So, I listened to his podcast and he had said about this movie with Ray, but I had no idea that you were on it. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I am fangirling some more. So that's all. Awesome. That's amazing. That's just great. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So Sorry. the idea of working with his family again, again, with Ray's personality and Ray directed it, wrote it and is acting in it and of course producing it. So, so Ray had, big, uh, big responsibility here. And he, he brought everybody together and you know, his personality, uh, and not only him, but the crew, the whole crew was marvelous. We had a great, great feeling for each other. And, and it couldn't, it couldn't happen for, for at a, at a better subject matter to have that cohesive family together. Uh, that my boys, uh, my my grandsons, uh, my my wife, my so on and so forth. And the best and the wonderful thing for an actor is <clears throat> that Ray works with you. He's beautiful. Uh, you know, I have uh, always have a lot of ideas and uh, uh, and different, you know, whatever whatever creations. And and he, you know, they liked it. Bo both writers. There was another writer on the Mark. Uh, 
as well. And so we worked cohesively together, you know, and, and that was a beautiful thing for me. Uh, and I really miss it. I mean, I finished it in three weeks and, and, and think about it. As a matter of fact, last night, you know how we are, we're crazy. Uh, we're crazy in terms of, of, of wanting to get it perfect. And last night, what was bugging me last night was the way I did ended one scene. And now I know exactly how to do it, to make it perfect. And I don't, I'm not sure I got it on film. And so it, all night, it was just last night, it was, it was keeping me awake. And I, it's already gone, finished, you know, I did it already. But right. I mean, thank God in the theater, I mean, I, I, you know, you do a performance and all you think about, all I think about is how can I fix it? Right. You know, how can I make it better? What did I miss? What laugh did I get? What, what moment did I miss? So theater, thank God you're coming back tomorrow to fix it and to do it. You know, one of the things I've always said about our profession is it's the only place where you get to live life over. Mm, that's so great. That's such great words. I love that. I love that. I, I you know, I get... <laughs> I could talk to you. I have so many qu more questions for you, but this, you know what? I know. Before that, how, so how was it working with Sebastian? And then I want to ask oh, you terrific. about. Uh, yeah, I know I want to ask you a couple more things, but how was it working with Sebastian? Sebastian was great. You know, he was. You know, he's only done four films. Right. As a matter of fact, Sebastian. He's a. I told him he was a natural actor, and he appreciated right. that. But it, he's a, he is a natural actor. He's studied and so on and so forth which is counter to me uh, in terms of all the studying I've done. Uh, <laughs> he, but he uh, um, has, a, has a very good presence. Mm -hmm. He's good, he's strong. And, uh, and he has an actual delivery and so on. So it's God bless him. And give you a little, uh, uh, he, he's, he's going to do a movie with his father, about his father. <gasps> with, he is. Uh, guess who's playing his father? You? Robert De Niro. Oh, I was going to say you. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> wow. But That's De great. De Niro playing his dad. Yeah. So he's doing a movie. Good for, you know what? Good for him. He really, I, I, yeah. I really truly like him. I, and, and, and with Ray, just to, Ray has become such a good actor. You know, he did his sitcom. He did his stand up. He did, you know, the came morphed into the sitcom, obviously. And by the way, that to me is the perfect sitcom about family, about idiosyncrasies, about driving each other crazy, about everybody's yeah. little du -du 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 little habits, <laughs> little little snide remarks. I love that. That's that <laughs> to me is you know, right. No big statement. No that I, that to me was the, one of the last bastions of, of what <laughs> sitcom. You know. <laughs> left. Um, you know. It, he it went just, in, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. It just dawned on me uh, a couple of days ago that I worked with Doris Roberts, his, oh, his, his, yeah, his mother. Yeah. I played in Honeymoon Killers and also we did a Broadway show together. I worked with Patricia Heaton in a movie called uh, Engagement Ring with, uh, with, with Kazan, with uh, 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 Laney? Uh, Laney Kazan. Laney, uh -huh. Laney Kazan, Patricia Heaton. I did a, a, a movie with Peter Boyle which was uh, uh, Fist, uh, the, uh, the Fist oh movie gosh. with Stallone. Uh -huh. And so I worked with the cast, now Ray. <laughs> I haven't worked with the tall guy, the brother. <laughs> Ray, but Ray's become a very good actor. So we all, yeah. I mean, he, he also, uh, I studied also with Joanna Bexon and a lot of comics had studied with Joanna Bexon, Ray being one of them, but that's terrific. Mm. We cannot wait for that to come out. I, I cannot let you go without talking about Fiorello LaGuardia. Nice. I got to see you. Uh, it's got to be like 2015 or so. As a matter of fact, I remember I was remember I was sitting next to Monica Crowley, uh, no, and it was at the Le, the Le, the De La Court Theater, the La Court, um, no, on 76th Street on the east side. 76th Street, yeah, it was. Uh, I don't. They changed the name. I forget yeah. what it's. 76th Street, it uh, just, just off. Uh, Saint Baptiste Avenue, is that like Saint John? Avenue. Saint John Baptiste? No, it was it was no. Okay. It was it was there was a. I forget what they that the theater the court yeah I'm saying court but that's the one in Central Park anyway I got to see you I got to see you live I love that story uh, you played that many many years ago as well you reworked it you called it the little flower um, what, what, anything 
happening with that story. And now, more than anything, the mayoral race, what's going on, the mayor that we've had that's destroyed our beautiful city, what is yeah. happening? That. Anything? I know. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I, that's the thing I've got to do is revive this show. I haven't done it for a while. Please. Uh, revive this show and, and, and get it out there now because our city, our city is in, what have we done to New York City? What is the matter with us? We've done we've done it to our country, but to Broadway and where where yeah. things are alive in New York, we've destroyed the city. Don't let anybody see it. Doesn't anybody care what's happened to our country? What's happened to our city? I mean, it's all there to be seen. And you know the sick part about all this: the other side accuses us of the same thing that they do. They believe that we are the enemy that making, we're, we're responsible for the city. I've spoken, I've spoken to people in, in Portland, Oregon. They don't know what's going on. They say nothing is happening here in Portland where they're ripping, we're having riots and ripping things down and burning police stations and, and so on. They don't, that, that those, those who are of the other side don't see it. I don't know what's going on because, well, the, the, look what the news, the media does. They don't report it. We have ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, M, I mean, all, uh, a, all reporting the same story that has nothing to do with reality that's really going on. I mean, if you look at your newspaper uh, and, and you see this, well, there were 30 shootings in, in Chicago each day. Uh, you know, if they want to go black on black murders, that's where, hello. <laughs> Are you hearing that? I am. <laughs> what is that? That's your phone. Oh, probably your phone. Okay. We'll ignore it. We'll ignore it. Can you pick it up or what? No, no worries. No worries. We got you. Um, I'm we'll just wait. We'll just wait till it ends. Okay. We're, we're a little so anyway, bit yeah, well, I, I, I completely yeah. agree with you. Uh, you know, Allowing no bail, uh, also a huge thing, the whole broken windows, the whole, because you know what, those little crimes, I'm not saying somebody should go to Rikers Island for jumping a turnstile, because, and that's what yeah. they say. Well, oh my, like, that's not what I said, but the little crimes ultimately turn into bigger crimes. Um, and the guy was in this let go, he's 107 arrests, no mm -hmm. bail. We've totally, we've totally, we've totally lost it. We've totally lost yeah. it. I completely agree with you. I, I, I urge everybody to, re I, this is what I say. If you're a lifelong Democrat or whatever, just do me a favor. This is what I say. Just do me a favor. Just look at both sides. That's all yeah. I ask. Just look at, and if, and if you still don't like the one side, then it, everybody's right to vote. And that's another thing. Don't tell me who to vote for. Don't tell me who to vote for. I'm done with that. I'm done with all of it. I I I can't. I, I I I agree with you. And you know, money talks. And 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 if they don't take care of the crime, I said this on my podcast the other day. I do a solo one. We can have the best restaurants in the world. We can open everything up, which we're not there yet, by the way. Not even close, in my yeah. opinion. No one's going to come here if they think they're going to get hit on the head with a lead pipe, okay? And no one's, get, you know, it's just not going to happen. So I, I, I completely, we've lost it. We've lost law and order. We've lost, and it goes back to the first thing that we were talking about. One of the first things was about respect. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the idea of defunding the police. Defunding the police? Are you out of your mind? You should be giving the police more money and right. having more police. And the, and the only reform that we need is the people have to be reformed to follow, to have respect and to follow the law. That's the reform we need. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree. Uh, I respect you immensely. Uh, you are one of my favorite people on the planet. I love talking to you. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> I, 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 I want people to just look, go on your Wikipedia. You don't have a, you don't have a website, do you? I, mean, I think I do. Tony Lobo. Oh, you do. Okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. And Tony Lobo. Yeah. Tony at AOL.com. Also, um, what am I on? Uh, yeah, uh, You're Facebook on IMD, and, IMDb. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. IMDb. And oh, I have to, I'm sorry, I have to mention this one thing. So uh, uh, last month or a month and a half ago, I was down in Florida. I had done a show and then I went to my uncle's. And uh, so he goes, uh, he's like, oh, I want to watch this movie. And so I was like, one year, so we sat down, we're watching the movie and it was the, the Killing the Irishman. Oh, yeah. Was, so I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm like, he's my, that's Tony LoBianco, he's my friend. <laughs> I was, <laughs> my, uncle's, my, uncle's like, my uncle's like, you know him? And I go, yes, I know him. <laughs> That was a good movie. Yeah. Oh my uh, God, you were amazing in it. I loved you. Oh, oh my you. God, I loved you in it. Oh, you're just, you're so wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate Thank it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll email you guys the link uh, when it's going to be up this week. I, I hope to see you in person. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> person. And you know, there, there, are, there are two things that we're talking about. Uh, you know, I did the Just a Common Soldier. Now the, it's a, it's a five minute video. It's a tribute to our veterans. Mm. It has received 35 million views and also two Emmys. Wow. So take a look at that. And also uh, go to the blues, Tony Lobianco, the blues, a tribute to our police. Go to go, see, go watch that. I, I, your viewers and and, uh, and, and just a common soldier is a tribute to our veterans. And th th it's right there for free it's, uh, at YouTube. You can we'll, see the book. We'll put those in the link. We'll put in the, in the show, we'll put that to a link to your, to your, you know, to the bio. We'll put those two, Great. we'll put those in there. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you for everything that you do. My name is Ellen Karras. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Greek Chick Comic, uh, Facebook, Ellen Karras, Greek Goddess Comedy. And uh, my website, ellencarris.com, where you'll find this and all the other podcasts that we have done for the last six seasons every week. Uh, I thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Till next time. Bye.